Welcome back to Driva. If you missed any of the previous live streams in May, don't worry, you can find them all here on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. Today's speaker is Tom Rand. Tom is an author, a venture capitalist and a philosopher, a rather unique combination that provides a broader view on how to take climate action, both as individuals and societies. Tom is passionate, but he's also practical, and we'll look at how to create pragmatic solutions to the climate crisis. Everybody's heard the horrible story of a frog in a pot of water on a stove. Um, <laughs> you heat the water up slowly enough and the poor frog, there's something about its physiology where it's unable to hop out of the pot because the water warms too slowly for it to react. It's a horrible story. Um, as a metaphor, maybe a bit overused, but I find it quite effective when we talk about climate for two reasons. I mean, one, I think it's accurate to say our pot is getting hot enough that it presents an existential risk infrastructure this century is nothing to laugh about. Um, so I think it's not an overstatement for one thing, but it's more interesting for me because the, there's something about the frog's physics that the rules of engagement in its body and brain that prevents it from moving. And I think if for humans, if we look beneath the, all the noise in the news and all this crap, if you look beneath the surface, of our cognitive, cultural, economic, and financial systems, we'll find rules lurking there, tectonic plates that are preventing us from moving. And if you can find out what those rules are that are locking us into place, presumably we can either change the rules or understand them better in order to hop into action. We cover really four areas, like I said, in the, in, I go into some detail in the book, cognitive, cultural, legal, economic, and financial. Um, that's just a fancy way of saying, one, it's very hard to believe, literally hard for our brains to take in that climate risk is an existential risk to us. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today, the psychology of, of climate change, because I think it's the, it's the primary piece, you start there. It's hard to believe. Um, uh, we also know, we feel like our hands are tied even when we do believe it. Um, we've got jobs to go to and kids take to school and there's sort of a whole bunch of stuff happening that makes it difficult to act. There's an existing economic activity. Um, and market forces look overwhelming, right? Coal is cheap. It's very difficult to get off coal. It's cheap. So it seems like there's a mountain of market forces aligned against us. And then lastly, the last gasp of the skeptic on the financial side is it costs too much. You know, I, you know if, I, if I believe it, it's hard to act because my hands are tied. I'm acting against market forces. And then if I do act against market forces, it costs too much. It's a bad deal in the name of one notoriously idiotic climate skeptic. I'm gonna focus on the psychology because I think it all starts there. So let's start with how we, how we think. Um, I th we know that siren songs in ancient myths, right? Siren song is a song of irresistible beauty that sailors are attracted to. They can't help it and they sail in that direction and they boom, hit the rocks and die a horrible death in, in cold water. Um, I think climate denial, not acknowledging the existential nature of this risk is a siren song for our brains, for our minds. Um, and by denial, I don't just mean active denial where someone says it's not true, right? <laughs> There's always, you know, we live in a liberal democracy, you're allowed to hold stupid beliefs and there's always gonna be people that need to be dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century, that's life. So active denial is one thing and it's pretty, you know, it's prevalent in the United States in particular amongst the GOP, I, 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 there's reasons for that. Um, but there's something more pernicious than active denial, right? Active denial is kind of a very easy, obvious target. You're an idiot <laughs> and we're gonna drag you kicking and screaming in the 21st century. But more pernicious I think is passive denial. Passive denial is where if asked the question, you would say, yes, I do believe climate risk is existential. NASA's got it right. You know, the IPCC are correct and so on and so forth. But we act in our day-to-day -day lives as if it wasn't the existential threat that it is, right? We're not acting on that existential threat. Even those of us who, who understand that it's true. And the question is, well, why, why aren't we acting? So that's passive denial. Um, and we've been sleepwalking on this issue for 20 years and there's reasons for that. And again, it's because both active and passive denial is kind of a, a magnet, a siren song for our brains. And if we can understand why, we can begin to change, to change that narrative, to change that, that kind of behavior. So we need to start with thinking about how we think about climate. Um, our, there's really two modes of thinking 
for us human beings. There's conscious, unconscious, there's slow, fast, thoughtful, deliberative, intuitive. That delineation of, of the division of labor means roughly the same thing. The fast, unconscious, underground, intuitive part dominates our cognitive activity massively. About 90% of the neural effort in our brains is unconscious, fast, and automatic, and so on. And there's a reason for that. Th that we are not like Dr. Spock on Star Trek, hyper-rational Turing computer. We are Captain Kirk. We are deeply emotive, embodied creatures with self-interest and intuitive understandings of things. We are wonderfully human. That's what makes us so good at certain kinds of things. You can't teach how to be human to a computer. Um, and the reason for that is this. From the day we're born to the day we die, more at the beginning than at the end, unfortunately, for those of us who are nearer the end, um, we are forming connections, literally hardwired connections between sounds and ideas, words and events, um, context and description, and, and for, you know, tiger, roar, scary, mum, lovely, money, powerful, politics, corrupt. <laughs> Um, whatever world we're living in, we're forming millions and millions and millions of these kinds of connections that are automatic, that are, that are associated with each other by our experience as embodied creatures with a point of view. That's what makes us wonderfully human. And that, that worldview, that common sense, is how we make sense of the world. It's how we disambiguate meaning in a very complex environment, right? Very difficult to teach to a computer. For us, it's natural. And that natural way of being in the world is because of this very fast set of, of, of activities that are hardwired associations between ideas and events and so on that we've been forming since we were born. Now that worldview, that set of common sense, a set of hardwired connections, which is beneath our conscious view, acts to predetermine, to pre-shape our reaction to new events, right? Don't forget, it's how we make sense of the world. It preconditions our reaction to new beliefs and new events. Unless we think this is sort of too abstract and I'm hand-waving at something that doesn't really exist, it does. Um, and in, in, in a person, it, there's, a, there's a personal history in forming that common sense. In a culture, there's shared experiences that form that common sense. And you can see and experience the narratives that we share as evidence of what that worldview might be. So for example, I'm from the West. In the West, largely, you know, there are ideas that are embedded in all of our uh, social narratives. Some examples, there's many, many, many of them. And they're, they're particular to every country. They're particular to, even to neighborhoods and so on. But largely in the West, Human ingenuity knows no bounds, right? This is a deeply held belief that we all share. The future is better than the past. The notion of progress, this underpins every political narrative, every story I've ever read. The future is better, the way parents talk with their children and plan for the future. The future is better than the past. Progress, this is, this is endemic to Western civilization. Nature is ours to control. Ever since Sir Francis Bacon talked about opposable thumbs and a rational mind, nature has been seen as ours to control. There are exceptions which frighten us, like COVID. That's why it's such an extraordinary event. We're not in control anymore. Um, and that's why climate change is so frightening, right? We may not be in control. But by and large, our food is delivered, our heat, our homes are heated, we get on planes and fly around. Nature certainly looks like it's ours to control from where I sit. And the economy can grow forever. That's another deeply held belief if you work in business or you deal in economics. The notion the economy can't grow forever is, her is a heretical belief within those communities. Now, I'm not saying these beliefs are false. Far from it. They're, they're true so far, right? They, they, we hold them because they, we have empirical evidence of them being true. We've lived a life such that they appear to be true. It's how we make sense of the world. Human ingenuity knows no bounds. Future does seem better than the past so far. There's been a lot of progress. Nature does seem like ours to control. So I'm not making a claim of whether these beliefs are true or false. I think they're probably true. They're true, certainly true so far. What I'm claiming is those beliefs, which are deeply embedded in our unconscious narrative, are fundamentally at odds with climate risk being existential. And that's why it's so difficult to act on or even take in the existential nature of climate risk. It runs counter to how we see ourselves in the world. 
right? So lest we think this is too abstract, that's the narrative that's down there. You can measure this stuff. So the stuff I'm about to, to go over is bog standard 20th century cognitive science. There's nothing, there's nothing unusual about this. First thing your brain is going to do is avoid effort. And for your brain, that means avoiding unnecessary discomfort. Emotion is a fundamental driver of how we form beliefs. So if some, you, you, you know, when we, any of us encounter the existential nature of climate risk, the first thing our brain will do is feel very uncomfortable with that risk because it runs counter to our worldview. It can't be true. The future is better than the past. Therefore, it can't be true. And our unconscious brain will do a bait and switch. And we'll actually answer a different question, which is how does climate risk make me feel? It makes me feel uncomfortable. Therefore, it can't be true. So everybody's default position, myself included, everybody's default position on this is it can't be true because it runs counter to how we see ourselves. And so again, I'm not making a judgment about these cognitive biases or these reactions. I'm making an empirical claim about how we think, all of us, again, me included. So we all start by not by, by disbelieving the existential nature of the risk. Confirmation bias. You will seek evidence that confirms beliefs you already have. It's difficult to avoid confirmation bias in the hard sciences, never mind the complicated world of human beings. So we don't start out by not believing it. We then seek evidence to confirm that disbelief. Someone then provides an argument to say it's real. Affect heuristic. If you don't like the, the outcome of an argument, you'll disbelieve the argument. You don't follow the argument through to its logical conclusion. You just don't believe it. I'm a, I'm a professional philosopher. I have a PhD in philosophy. It takes years of training to be able to actually get to the end of an argument. And if you don't like the conclusion, to believe it. It's very difficult to do. We, that's not what we do as human beings. We don't like the out, outcome of the argument. We discount the argument. Um, and then, of course, then a peer group bias. We tend to value the opinions of peers more than we value the opinions of experts. Our peer group includes our, you know, our families and our friends. It also includes famous people. So Neil Young doesn't know he's my peer, uh, but he is. <laughs> so that group that we're surrounded by in our in our lives, we believe them more than we believe the experts. So you can see how we slept walked into this, right? We all start by not believing it's ex an existential risk. Maybe it's real, but it's not existential. Come on. Uh, otherwise, then the future is worse than the past. I don't believe it. You then seek evidence and believe there's lots of evidence out there. If you want to believe climate change isn't that bad, turn on Fox News. <laughs> there's lots of it. Lots of clickbait on the internet. So there's lots of, 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 of ways for us to confirm that disbelief, even if we're doing it unconsciously, right? Um, and then the arguments that are given to us in the form of data and graphs and all the rest of it, I don't like the arguments. I don't believe it. Um, and are, we're surrounded by people that are subject to the same forces. And so we've been sleepwalking into this for a very, very long time. The halo effect, you know, you have a professional class of people defending vested interests to continue to burn fossil fuels who are media experts. Halo effect means someone with shiny white teeth and nice hair is more believable than a pointy-headed scientist, right? So you have a professional PR campaign that keeps this, this psychology alive, that keeps it, that keeps it going, the storyline going. So you can see how we slept back. And this is, again, bog standard cognitive science. Nothing I've said is at all controversial. So thinking about climate change is literally difficult. We have a worldview that is in that counter real. And we have a bunch of cognitive biases, guard dogs at our mind that will keep out this belief. So rather than trying to go head to head against that by putting out more scary stories about climate change, we need to change the narrative. We need to wake up our frog. And the way we wake up our frog is we tell a narrative about climate change. We don't deny the truth of it, but we tell a narrative that starts with something that people want to believe, a new story of clean energy abundance. Like the work that we do, the work that I do as a venture capitalist, it plays into a very important broader picture. If we can tell success stories about solar and wind power and energy storage and you know, a future of clean energy abundance underwritten by technology, not, not oil and coal and that, but technology and an economic stimulus predicated upon rebuilding that energy infrastructure, using human ingenuity to build a future of prosperity and so on. You can see how that story, starting from that narrative about possibility, the solution looks like this, right? The future is better than the past. There's abundant energy. It's underwritten by human ingenuity et cetera, et cetera. You can work back to the present. Here's what we need to do. That's a narrative people will believe. 
and want to believe and want to engage with because it speaks to our unconscious view of ourselves as innovative, progress-seeking creatures where the economy grows and we are able to deal with the nature. And like this is a way of changing the narrative such that our cognitive biases are brushed out of the way, right? We kind of put the, 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 the guard dogs of our brain to sleep with this narrative, which happens to be true. And that's why the work that we collectively do in building strong, big, global, interesting, innovative energy companies is so important. It's not just the economic benefit that we get from that and the solutions that we, that we put forward from a, from, a, from, a, from a GHG perspective. It's the story that the public begins to engage with, that politicians begin to engage with. And the narrative about climate change now becomes a narrative about possibility. It becomes a narrative that speaks to the best in us rather than contradicts what we think is the best in us. There's examples of this, like the cost of solar energy. If you look at it over a time horizon that's relevant, like decades, not years, it's a vertical curve compared to oil, natural gas, and nuclear and so on. If you think that the traditional energy sources can compete with this cost curve, you're absolutely bananas. Energy storage is following the same cost curve. The best story we have in, in, in Arcturn's arsenal that I pull out all the time is Hydrostore. Hydrostore is a battery made out of air, rock, and water that you can situate pretty much anywhere that is by far the cheapest, biggest, baddest energy storage technology I've ever seen, utility scale. You, it's a giant cavern underground. You fill it with water and you pump air in and out of it. The column of water keeps the air pressure constant and blah, blah, blah. But it is a battery that can store a nuclear plant's output all night long. That's how big it is. Its cost is one-fifth the cost of where lithium-ion batteries think they're going to be in 10 years, and it lasts five times as long. And the equipment is oil and gas equipment. All the compressors and expanders that, that deal with that air, Baker Hughes, comes right from the oil and gas sector. All the underground stuff, big engineering firms do this all the time. So you're speaking to parties that are at the table in playing another game. You're saying, come play my game. Look at the stuff we can build together. So again, it's not just important because there's a result we can get. It's important because the narrative that we're talking about to the oil and gas sector, to Baker Hughes, to the mining sector, to the financial community, I have a story of progress here that is one that we can speak to collectively that, that we get excited about. And it, it feeds right through to the public and how they vote and so on. So I think the work we do is important, not just because of the, the actual effect, but because the way it can change the public narrative about climate change. So I'll kind of wrap up here. So the way in which we get over the problem of it being hard to believe is we talk about clean energy abundance. That wakes our frog up from a psychological perspective. In terms of the, of the other, you know, our hands are tied. Well, you know, our hands are tied because, you know, corporations just kind of want to make money. And so you change the rules by which those companies operate, which, and how do you change the rules? You change the rules by, by dismissing the myth of the free market. The free market is, a, is nonsense made up by somebody who doesn't understand capital controls on banks and all the rest of it. There's never been a free market. You want to market forces to act in, in, in favor of climate change. You want to use market forces. They're not free floating stuff. Price on carbon is like gravity in this picture. You don't know where this water is going to end up. You let the market figure out all the details, market forces. You cannot ignore market forces. You use market forces. And gravity makes sure all that water ends up at the bottom of the hill. Well, price on carbon is like gravity. It pulls an economy towards a low carbon state without dictating how you get there, without deciding what technologies are winners and losers. That's our job. So you price carbon to pull the economy into a low carbon state. And that's how you counter that problem. And in terms of it costing too much, we have absolutely no way of measuring the cost of not acting. Um, so all of the crap about it costing too much relies on a couple of spreadsheets that are fundamentally and utterly incapable of, 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 of coming up with the, with the benefit side of this, right? What, what's the benefit of keeping our, our, our ecosystem in a stable state? We have no way of measuring that. So, so cost-benefit analyses are the wrong language. We, used to, we should use language um, that people understand, like uh, the cost of climate action is ensuring the planet. What does it cost to ensure the planet? Take uh, the, that most notorious uh, idiot skeptic, uh, even going by his bad deals uh, uh, arguments, it costs us about a coffee and a donut a day per person to ensure the planet. So... Uh, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. And if you talk about it in that way, people will understand. 
And I've gone very quickly over these last three because the point was to talk about the psycho psychological piece. If you don't get the psychology right, if you don't convince people in a liberal democracy that they want to act on this problem, they won't acknowledge the problem is real. And that's where we've been for 20 years. So that's why our collective work is so important. We break that narrative. We break the fundamental psychological barrier to people acting on this problem. Look, we live in a time of unprecedented wealth, innovation, science and engineering, manufacturing capacity, capital markets. There is no question that we are capable of resolving this problem in the next 10 or 15 years, which is how long we have, if we simply wake up, <laughs> which is really the point of this book, right? That, that the solutions are well understood. The policy is understood. The capital is, is sitting there in money market. Like, it's all there. We just need to deploy it. And to deploy it, we fundamentally just need to wake up. And that's the point of my story. So I will pause there and thank you for listening to me. And I will uh, see if there are any questions and I'm happy to take them. And you couldn't possibly have agreed with everything I said. So please um, ask me whatever you like. Thank you so much, Tom, for that great talk on human motivation and what buttons to press to get us all moving for climate investing. Tom will stay with us in the comments section. So keep your questions and comments coming. Tomorrow, Driva will be brought to a close by the Norwegian Minister for Trade, Iselin Nybø. Iselin will outline how Norway is moving towards a carbon neutral future and what her priorities are for building the green economy. So don't forget to join us tomorrow at 12.30 for this exclusive wrap-up to Driva 2020.